Okay guys, April here again with another comic book review. I'm just gonna do a whole September wrap-up review of all the comics I read or most of the comics I read. I was do going to do this together with my novel review but I just decided to separate things because in case you didn't know, hi I'm April and I'm random. <music> So for September I have a small stack of books here and we're just going to go through these one by one and hopefully they make some kind of sense. I have some notes here and I uh, try to keep me on track and I don't ramble too much but I'm already doing it so fail. First up I have Black Science. This is written by Rick Merminder and the art is done by Matteo Scalera and Dean White. This is kind of an epic sci-fi fantasy about a scientist named Grant McKay. He has developed the means for interdimensional travel via a machine called the Pillar. This machine is somehow either broken or sabotaged and he, his crew, and his family are stuck in a place called the Eververse, desperate to get back to their own time and dimension. This reminds me a lot of Lost in Space, just with dimensional shifts and a lot of violence. The story starts off pretty hot. Um, it's going pretty fast, but then it kind of cools down as we jump from the past to the present, filling out uh, McKay's journey up until this point. The Devil is in the details with this one so you have to pay attention while you're reading. I'm liking it so far. The writing is solid. The pacing is really good. It's not as fast as Fear Agent. However, this is just the first volume so I'm just at the beginning. Reminder definitely has an aesthetic he likes for his story and it's on display here. Here's some of it. This doesn't have that cosmic feel that you found in Fear Agent. However, um, it's more grounded and vicious and loud. Um, there's a fight or an explosion almost every <laughs> three pages. I gave it 3.5 out of four stars. Again, like I said, I did enjoy the story. Um, I did have to read it twice because I got a little lost, but once I got it, once I found where we were going, I got into it. Again, like I said, you gotta pay attention. But yeah, so far so good. I do intend to continue the story. Black Science, Rick Remender. If you like science fiction, um, kind of epic style fantasy, uh, I think he's a good person to pick up. Next up, I have Son of Shaolin. This was written by Jay Longano and the art is by Kenan White and Diego Rodriguez. This is labeled a Kung Fu epic in the style of David Carradine's Kung Fu TV series if it had been blended with Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon. It's about Kyrie, an orphan graffiti artist from Harlem who one night discovers that he is now in the possession of a mystic power. Almost simultaneously, a mysterious man named Master Fong appears to Kyrie and tells him that he is a descendant of an ancient Shaolin master and has now come into possession of these powers due to the death of his most recent uh, relative. Master Fung offers to train Kyrie in how to use his new powers in order to defend himself because another uh, Shaolin descendant is on the hunt. His name is Red Fist and he has been traveling the world collecting powers from other Shaolin descendants in a very Highlander fashion. There can be only one. <gasps> Basically this is a journey of self-discovery and realizing one's true destiny. How can you go wrong with that? It's familiar but it's well done and it has some really nice moments. If I was going to nitpick, I would say that some of the secondary characters needed a little more development to truly feel the weight of their importance. Other than that, I enjoyed this story. I really did like the artwork. There's some great use of color here. I love the purples and the pinks. Just nice use of pages. Uh, I like how they kind of fill them out. Let's see. Oh, like this one. Yeah. Red fist right there. Don't he look badass? Looks are deceiving, y'all. 
overall I like this story. I gave it a 3.5 to 4 stars. Uh, mostly because it's a really good start. Uh, but there's a huge cliffhanger and after doing some research I'm not really certain if they're going to continue this story. Not in this format anyway. I did hear a rumor I suppose that um, The Rock, um, Dwayne Johnson has optioned this piece to produce it for either television or film. So we may get an extended narrative in that format but I think they might just be done in this one. But even as a one shot, I really did enjoy this story. And if you find a copy that you can afford, I would suggest picking it up because it was nice. It was fun. And the, I really like the art. I would say the biggest question mark of this stack is this. This is Sidekick written by J. Michael Straczynski. Artwork by Tom Mandrake and Hi-Fi. Not sure if Hi-Fi is a team of people or just a nickname. This is a twist on the standard superhero duo narrative, but it, where I knew it was going to be dark, this was kind of bleak. In this story, superhero defenders of cities is very common. A lot of cities have them and Red Cow and Flyboy here are the defenders of a place called Soul City. We catch up with them where they have just saved the city from their most recent threat and in appreciation for their efforts, the city throws them a parade. Uh, both are in attendance, but during the uh, event, Red Cow is assassinated and Flyboy's life just spirals out of control. He is abandoned by nearly everyone he knows. Even the city turns his back on him. And even though he offers to kind of step up and take Red Cow's place as the lead defender of the city, they only see him as a sidekick and they don't want anything to do with him. Without purpose and support, Flyboy becomes desperate for any connection and his behavior becomes erratic and disturbing. However, the events surrounding Red Cow's assassination aren't what they seem. And as more details are uncovered, things get really ugly. What I like about Straczynski is that he isn't afraid to get emotional. He allows his characters to luxuriate in the darker parts of their psyche and that does not always lead to a emotional healthy breakthrough, especially not in this case. His protagonist here is not exactly sympathetic but that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Stories about broken people are sometimes uncomfortable but kind of relatable and you get some satisfaction in being able to understand them even on that deep and dark level. Uh, I think one of the downsides of this particular story is the artwork. Uh, it's kind of sad and angry but that is the mood of the story. The color palette is kind of that I would say like Zack Snyder's DCU. It's appropriate but I, I'm not fully invested in it. At the end I gave it three stars. I do feel that it's a fair assessment from what I got from the story. I do intend to go on and read the final volume. I think this was only a two volume run because uh, I do want to see how this ultimately ends. However Honestly, I think I need to think about it a little more. Maybe if I read them closer together back to back, I'll have a difference of opinion. But right now, three stars seems pretty on the money for me. Let's step back into the light with Motor Crush. This is volume one, written by Brendan Fletcher, Cameron Stewart, and the art is done by Babs Tarr. This is a high octane sci-fi adventure about a competitive bike racer named Domino Swift. She's a rising star in the World Grand Prix racing competition. However, she also competes in a race called the Cannonball. The Cannonball is an illegal street race where the participants compete for an engine boosting stimulant called Crush. It's illegal to use Crush on the WGP circuit and Domino is not a cheater. She doesn't use it on her bike. She drinks it. This would be a lethal habit for anyone else, which begs the question, who and what is Domino Swift? I'm liking this. The story is fun, fast, and well paced. Uh, Domino is an excellent protagonist. You like her from the start. She is flawed and fantastic. The artwork is also really nice. 
it is fresh and quirky and you feel the speed that's domino's girlfriend on the back of the bike she looks like cotton candy <laughs> that's what i thought anyway i thought it was really nice you get that real beach vibe from this whole story i give this a 4.5 out of 5 stars it ticked a lot of my boxes it's a great story with interesting characters, diverse representation, and a fun mystery. I dug it, and I do plan to continue on to volume two. Next up is my new favorite obsession, and that is The Wicked and the Divine. I read volumes two, three, and four. I thought I didn't read four when I did my TBR, but I had. Oops. I am loving this story. I think I've spoke about it already once before. However, for brief catch up, it's about gods. They are real. They come to earth every 90 years. They live among us for two years and then they die. In this iteration, they came in around 2014 and they are basically presenting themselves as modern day pop celebrities. Uh, they sing, they dance, they have concerts and meetups and it's all very contemporary and stylized and disturbing. I don't want to say too much about the story because at this point I would have to be giving away spoilers. I will say that each one of these volumes um, does answer questions in a previous volume but it always ends on a very <laughs> exciting cliffhanger. I'm still loving the dominant characters and I am getting a little more into what is actually going on. Their return to earth and living among us, there is a purpose for that which I believe we are discovering that some people may have forgot what they're supposed to be doing here. But um, otherwise, I am still loving the story. The artwork is still amazing. Uh, Jamie McKelvey's artwork. Did I even mention who writes this? This is written by um, Kieran Gillen and Jamie McKelvey is the artist. There are several other people who also contribute to the story. But those are the two main artists. And they have created a fantastic story. I love the artwork in here, especially some of the covers, but I don't want to give too much away, but I'll show you a little something something. And oh, in volume three, yes, uh, Jamie McKelvey, I don't know if this was by design or not, but he doesn't do a lot of the artwork in here. I think he only does one or two issues and the rest are all done by guest artists, which, um, to a certain degree kind of pulled me out of the narrative. Not too much, the story is strong enough to hold up on its own, but um, the artwork did really distract from it because some of them didn't really stay within the milieu of having a very glamorous and stylized um, appearance, which in hindsight, reading more of the story, I think kind of feeds into one of the issues that these people are having. So when you take that away, it kind of, it kind of removes the glamour. So again, I don't know if that's intentional or not, but it did kind of throw me a bit, but it picks back up in the next volume. So we're okay. And some of the artists pretty much stayed in line with what McKelvey was doing. And then other artists, not so much. <laughs> and I'm just gonna say, some of these gods I like more than others. Who? In other words, I'm enjoying this immensely for maybe some wrong reasons, but don't hate me. I didn't tell them to do that. Otherwise, but aside from obviously the fan service and the imagery and the fan service here, I am enjoying the story immensely. Again, if you like, uh, I would say fantasy dealing with gods of various different cultures, kind of intermixing in a way a little like American gods, but nothing like American gods. Did that help? Okay, we're going to slip in to something new. I picked up Batman Damned. 
and the variant cover. The story is by Brian Nazarello. The art is done by Lee Bermejo. And this is the first book, first story, first issue released from DC's new um, black, DC black label imprint. Um, this is not like the Vertigo imprint. This is still under the DC banner, but it is supposed to be a series of more adult uh, one-off stories about uh, popular DC characters. Like this is Batman, obviously. Let's start with the obvious, and that is the construction of this book. It is much bigger, wider, and the paper quality is better. Let's put it up as a, you can see, much bigger, wider. DC is calling this a prestige format. I'm really liking it. And for $6.99, I think they should do a little more to make you feel like you're getting your money's worth. But the true value is on the inside. And Azarello begins a dark and mysterious story with the death of the Joker. And that's not a spoiler. It's actually written on the back. We, we meet Bratman, Bruce Wayne. He is severely injured and disoriented. He seems to have been either stabbed or shot uh, several times and he's bleeding out in the back of an ambulance. He doesn't remember his most recent events and he is kind of panicking. At, at one point we find him in an alley um, calling out for help, usually through his earpiece for Alfred who does not respond. But someone does, and it is John Constantine. If you know anything about John Constantine, then you know that there may be other forces at play here. He deals with more mystical and dark religious and spiritual um, entities as opposed to more alien or just pure psychopaths. Bruce is beset by either memories or hallucinations of a past that veers very far from his traditional canon, but we can't trust what we're seeing. With Bruce's physical and emotional, current physical and emotional condition and Constantine's appearance um, and connection to the supernatural, things pretty much probably aren't what they appear to be. And from here we can talk about maybe the more scandalous part of this book, which is the artwork. There is full frontal nudity. Uh, yeah, you can see Bruce Wayne's twigs and berries in two shadowy dark panels. Uh, the question that was posed was, was it necessary? And the answer to this is always a no, of course it wasn't. But that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's not like Bruce is depicted naked walking into a Starbucks ordering a pumpkin latte. He's alone in every context of the word. In our culture, being naked, either physically or emotionally, is when a person is at their most vulnerable. I mean, we're talking about a man who runs around in the dark in a cape and cowl and drives a car built like a tank. The nudity is just a visual representation of Bruce's emotional state. It doesn't distract from the story and Bermejo gives us a tasteful and artistic representation, which he does throughout the entire book. The art honestly is the star here. It looks like a dream or a nightmare. But like, ooh, look at that. A moonlit Gotham. Cold and shadowy and sinister. Yeah, it's really nice. Bromeo's pen wraps masterfully around the characters and the landscape. It's a great attention to detail and his use of color and light is mesmerizing. I mean, come on. Your eyes practically lick these pages. They are gorgeous. All in all, I enjoyed it. I would give this a definite four stars for the start. Um, Azarello is hit or miss for me. He can go a little hard, but so far I'm invested in the story. But let's not get crazy. The art alone is the reason why I will pick up the next two volumes. I should also mention that the first print of these has sold out, I think, across the nation. I don't think there's an available one sitting anywhere. 
However, um, it is still available for digital download. And I do believe they're going to release it in a second print. However, the second print plus the digital download will not have the nudity involved. So if you are concerned about that, just um, you can get a digital version or pick up a second release and it won't be there. I got the nudity one. Ooh. And last but never least, I have Doomsday Clock number seven, both um, traditional and variant versions. This is written by Jeff Johns, art done by Gary Frank. And uh, we have passed the halfway mark. Um, issue number seven out of 12. And if you've been patiently waiting for six issues, you finally get some release. Contact has been made. but it is not the sweet satisfaction that some have been expecting. In true Dr. Manhattan fashion, he lays out some truths with the dispassion of a hollow tip bullet. Some feelings get hurt, some faces get broken, just like any normal family reunion. I guess some people didn't realize that Ozymandias is trash. Welcome to reality, dude. And Superman seems to be on Dr. Manhattan's mind. That cannot be good. I can't really say more than that without giving away too many spoilers. But let me just say that Johns and Frank are rocking this series. The narrative is expertly woven with words and images adding fuel to the story. Uh, I suspect we are in for one hell of a second half and I am so here for it. Yeah. This was a bad time had by all. Five out of five stars. I don't know what else to say. When time permits, I'm going to read all seven issues in six rapid succession so I can get the full flush of this. And I'm going to do that again when I get all 12 issues because um, waiting every two months for one of these issues is like tiny pinches of torture. And I, I really just want it all now. I'm sorry, I'm not a modern person, but I have modern sensibilities and I want my stuff right now. I want the works, I want the whole works. Presents and prizes and sweets and surprises of all shapes and sizes and now, don't care how I want it now. So that's it guys. Those are some of the books that I read during September. What do you think? I think I have a nice little mix there. But yes, I'm pretty much investing a lot of time in reading things that I'm already passionate about like The Wicked and the Divine. And yes, I already have picked up volume number seven. Mm -hmm. But I am continuing to pick up new things and finding new stories of older volumes at the used bookstores. So, but in any case, what do you guys think? Are you reading any of these stories? Yes, I do realize that I lean heavily toward DC and Image Comics. However, I don't subscribe to any kind of um, Team Wars here. I do read Marvel stories that I'm interested in and I think I picked up some recently so you might see that in the recent future. However, uh, yeah, if you're reading any of these, tell me what you think. If you have suggestions that are kind of on par with this, let me know what you think of those. As always, if you like these videos, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe because your support is always appreciated. And uh, guys, I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.